प्रेफिस एंड प्रेल्यूड होली मदर श्री सरादा देवी बाय स्वामी गंभीरानंदा 1955 श्री रामाकृष्णा मैथ चेन्नई गॉड एज एसोसिएटेड विद हिज पावर इज अ लोन एबल टू सेट इन मोशन अ न्यू साइकिल ऑफ सोशल एंड स्पिरिचुअल रिजनरेशन एल्स इट इज इम्पॉसिबल टू कंसीव ऑफ द एब्सोल्यूट ब्राह्मण एज इन्वॉल्व इन एनी प्रोसेस ऑफ एवोल्यूशन वेन गॉड इनकारनेट्स एज मैन he invokes this power and then employs her for the good of men divine power thus propitiated by the lord himself becomes gracious and suitably rearranges the factors concerned for the advancement of erring and perplexed humanity not only this when god comes down as man divine power also accompanies him most often as a woman the descent of sita with ramchandra shri radhika with krishna Yasudhara with Buddha and Vishnu Priya with Sri Chaitanya emphasizes this fact in truth divine power whether on the spiritual or on the material plane or as the consort of an incarnation helps him immensely in his mission divorced from power his divine drama cannot be enacted nor can it be comprehended by us swami sardananda writes having discovered the eternal association of power with consciousness the rishis of india worshiped in all exceptionally energetic things and everywhere the deity who dances on the prostrate body of shiva this incomparable deity who promises both blessing and protection with her hands at the same time that she wears a necklace of heads was discovered by them as a reality and as such worshiped reverentially in the guru who is the spiritual guide in women who fascinate the world and in such elevating and degrading qualities as knowledge forbearance peace delusion torpor error etc having thus themselves attained all that men can aspire after they taught others how to be blessed by treading the same path dot bharte shakti puja p.20 again swami vivekananda realized that this sakti divine power had been awakened by shri ramakrishna for the rejuvenation of the present age and hence he sent forth this clarion call just imagine in your mind the acme of that resurgence with whose first stirrings the whole world is now resounding and give up all vain doubt and weakness to which slave nations easily succumb that formless and eternal power of brahman which in his in everything has again descended as the consort of the incarnation for the present age she has on the one hand helped him to fulfill his mission and on the other has spread her influence on various fields of human relationships thereby removing obstacles and setting india and along with her the whole world on a new road to progress Therefore it is that Swami Vivekananda who was blessed by them both salutes them thus a slave am i to both of you and to both do i prostrate myself not only has the descent of god a particular technique of its own but the manifestation of his power also has its own mode or to put it otherwise though the time and the purpose are the same for the incarnation of god and his power which are inseparable like fire and heat yet the objective is attained through the masculine body in one way and through the feminine in another thus it is that even though the entity cannot be split up there is a special value in following separately the events that accompany the feminine counterpart in the chandi 11 54 to 55 the goddess says whenever there arises any obstacle from the demons I shall come down in this way to destroy the enemy in olden times there was constant need for destroying the demons as they oppressed good and bad men alike their destructive power is not however confined to the physical plane the constant conflict that rages in human hearts between good and evil tendencies is also described in the upanishads as a battle waged by the demons against the forces of goodness In the present age this struggle has assumed the form of a challenge thrown out by disbelief materialism and sensuality to believe in god faith in the immortality of the soul 
and adherence to godliness. It is in consequence of this challenge that there has been a growth of irreligion, envy, enmity and passion which are a constant source of war resulting in the loss of innumerable valuable lives. The conflict on the psychological plane in the modern age is even more devastating than the old mythological war between the gods and the demons. The old antagonism seldom overstepped the limits of the physical world, but the present struggle has originated in the mental plane and is spreading to all spheres of everyday life, thus laying the axe at the very root of humanity. Hence the action of the divine power under existing circumstances has to be mainly on the mental plane. Above everything else, the present-day world needs moral progress and spiritual enlightenment. If faith, purity and devotion can once attain supremacy, the outer world is bound to change. The incarnate divine power is, therefore, now engaged in fighting internal enemies. The victory may come either by liquidating the sinner together with his sin or by transforming him through the natural attraction of genuine good feelings. The conversion of a heinous heart through moral excellence presupposes a greater strength than is necessary for killing an enemy outright. So in the present incarnation there is no clanging of weapons or the din of war but there is an abundance of modesty, humility, purity, goodness, practical love, and spiritual experience. Moreover, the deity has not only to remove obstacles. She has also to establish new goals and create fresh aspirations, and this is a tremendous task. God Himself need not come down for removing all hindrances from the path of His devotees. This can be accomplished by an inspired soul or by a partial divine manifestation. As the whole of humanity has to be raised to a higher pitch of realization, divine power herself takes the field. The emergence of the divine power today on the hoary background of Indian culture is indicative of a unique reanimation. Particularly is it bound to be so among women, the need of whose advancement is admitted on all hands. We cannot do better than echo the words of Swami Vivekananda who was convinced that India cannot prosper without revitalizing her womanhood, just as a bird cannot fly with one wing, and therefore it is that when God incarnated as Sri Ramakrishna, He worshipped God as Kali, the mother, accepted a woman as His guru, spiritual guide, assumed the role of a woman in some of his spiritual strivings, took upon himself the responsibility of educating and training his own wife, and preached the motherhood of God. In the middle of the last century, the womanhood of India was faced with a tremendous problem. India then was being swept off her feet by foreign ideals. A craze for imitating the West set in at the cost of indigenous values. The plan of educational reform envisaged in the dispatch of Sir Charles Wood dated 19th July 1854 gave only a vague indication of the kind of training that Indian women would get. True it is that India was not entirely wrong in welcoming foreign ideas and practices. On the contrary, it is quite in keeping with Indian tradition to enrich her life by assimilating foreign ideas while still retaining her own individuality. There is need for energizing our womanhood by drawing a little on foreign sources in order to make national life more vigorous and fruitful, at the same time that the West also learns something of our veneration for motherhood, so that Western civilization may have a stronger spiritual basis and a longer lease of life. But though each civilization has much to learn from another, it will spell disaster if the basic distinctions are ignored. For, though women are honored everywhere, that honor very often appears in the form of chivalry and appreciation of feminine charms. But India eulogizes chastity and motherhood, since the ideal aimed at is spiritual freedom which has for its foundation absolute self-control. Our ideal specimens of womanhood are Sita, Savitri and Damyanti. 
There is an evident conflict between the two standpoints and future world civilizations have either to choose sides or seek a rational rapprochement. The problem has assumed an urgency which it never had a hundred years ago. And yet the forces governing the destiny of India foresaw that unless Indian culture was saved from the deluge of modern ideas, the world would have no sure foundation on which the future Eastern and Western social edifices could be erected, while allowing for individual differences. There was need for providing a dependable model in the combined figure of Guru, Mother and Deity from which all could draw the necessary inspiration. Considered from all points of view, this task of resuscitating and perfecting the Indian ideal could be accomplished by none other than the Mother of the Universe herself, for in the middle of the last century no other force could succeed in making India conscious of her grand destiny and the world cognizant of her revitalizing message. This is the age-old tradition of India's spiritual ministry. Truly God's advent has been strictly in proportion to the moral degradation during the period beginning from the 1850s and ending with the 1920s. The greater the degradation, the greater is the divine power's response to the challenge of the times. The new advances of world civilization will commence with the worship of the Guru, Mother and Goddess as manifested in the recent past. Shri Krishna hints in the Gita that, Though God descends to the human world for the general good, men through the poverty of their intellect fail to gauge His real stature, hidden as He remains under His assumed mundane limitations. And thus, paradoxically enough, the conditions of divine descent were frustrating His gracious intention. Notwithstanding this drawback, it is only through those human bodies that God can reveal to erring and suffering humanity the means by which life can be made divine. For sunk as men are in their petty selfish pursuits, there is no other method for reinvigorating them for higher achievements. This transmission of fresh vigor and the communication of revitalizing power may follow different channels. In some cases the highest perfection of human ideals may be visibly demonstrated or they may be made more sublime and enduring through achievements of personal life or through grandeur of instruction. In other cases new paths may be opened up by divine decree, while in still others, human. Hearts may be more powerfully attracted towards cherished traditional human norms through charming divine despots. While all this is true, we must not jump to the conclusion that the mission of an incarnation is confined to a mere heightening of sublimity, or the establishment of fresh ideals, or the attraction of human hearts. For, though we may try to understand his contribution analytically, we have to remember that it is beyond human capacity fully to comprehend or formulate in words the significance of an incarnation, inasmuch as He is the embodiment of all kinds of spiritual moods. Besides, a power that is released for ages cannot be assessed by contemporary history. Nevertheless, we accept these three standards as a basis for an intellectual apprehension of the life of the Holy Mother, wherein we shall see the qualities of motherhood in their superhuman perfection, and we shall come to know how they acted in the present age for evolving new spiritual values. We shall also see how in her life the feminine virtues consequent on such positions in the family as daughter, sister, wife or matron reached their ideal states and above all, how her pristine purity was itself an inspiration to others. Is this all sentimental ebullition or a faint hint at reality? We invite the reader to raise this question again after finishing this biography, but we are convinced that he himself will discover the truth array long and be freed from doubt. But he must be forewarned that the life we are dealing with is in many respects extraordinary and it must be evaluated accordingly. The Holy Mother does not belong to that class of dazzling personalities who suddenly emerge in contemporary history and after assuming superhuman proportion for a while vanish forever, 
nor to that category of people who through bustling activity, flaming oratory, or the clatter of arms imperil human civilization and blacken history forever. She belongs to that galaxy of great characters who, by concretizing the human ideals in their lives raise world civilization to a higher level and whose influence, though seemingly inconsiderable to their contemporaries, lasts longer and expands forever. In fact, she is to be classed with such memorable figures as Sati and Sita whose advent purified human life and blazed the path for a fresh resurgence. All this is unquestionable. But still another question remains, if the power descended for the world as a whole, why should it have selected for its field an insignificant remote hamlet like Jairambati, detached as it is from all modern influences? Who can answer such a question? And, in fact, how many of those questions can we answer that arise in connection with the unpredictable movements of that inscrutable power that ever creates, sustains, and dissolves the world? And yet human intellect, though aware of its limitations, cannot desist from the quest. So we cogitate, had Jairambati any specialty, because of which it had such a proud privilege? Even a close scrutiny does not reveal any such, though the pages of history bear witness to the facts of Krishna's advent in Kamsa's prison and his childlike and boyish desports among cowherds, of Jesus' birth in a stable and his early training in a carpenter's house, and the descent of Ramakrishna in a husking shed and his subsequent life as a poor temple priest. And sociology points to the fact that when, under the impact of an aggressive foreign culture, the learned and moneyed classes in the towns are swept off their feet, indigenous culture maintains a precarious existence in the poor surroundings of remote villages. Moreover, Indian culture discovered a peculiar mode of self-perpetuation by entrusting itself into the hands of indigent Brahmans and penniless Gurus. Had Jairambati these factors in abundance? The first comprehensive life of the Holy Mother was published by us in English in 1940 under the title Sri Sarada Devi. It ran into a second edition in 1949. As one of the items of its program, the Central Committee of the Holy Mother Centenary Celebrations at the Belur Math Headquarters resolved in 1953 to bring out a standard volume on the life of the Holy Mother in English, Bengali and other languages. The task of writing this life devolved on Swami Gambhirananda. Accordingly, he wrote in Bengali the life of the Holy Mother entitled Shri Ma Sarada Devi. This was published by the Udbodhan Center, Calcutta, on 27 December 1953, the first centennial anniversary of the birth of the Holy Mother. The learned author has left no stone unturned to make the life exhaustive and interesting by incorporating as many facts and incidents of the mother's life as could be gleaned from all reliable sources, oral and documentary. The main narrative is profusely interspersed with conversations of the mother and, consequently, the book ably fills the place of an authentic volume on the life of the Holy Mother. The Central Committee had also decided that the English life should be published by us. It was at the request of the Central Committee that Swami Gambhirananda himself translated the Bengali book into English. We are happy to present this book to the public as the fulfillment of a resolution adopted in August 1954 by the Holy Mother Birth Centenary Committee, Madras. The original intention was to publish this book during the centenary year, 1954. But, mainly owing to the preoccupations with the centenary celebrations in the city, the plan could not be given effect to in time. Some footnotes of the original work have been omitted from the present volume and many have been added to explain Bengali manners and customs. A few facts that came to light after the publication of the Bengali book have also been included in the body of this volume. The life of the Holy Mother serves as a beacon light lighting up the obscure pathways of spiritual life and as a fountain at which humanity can slake its thirst for a higher life. 
We earnestly hope that the interest awakened in the hearts of the public by the centenary celebrations will assure us a wide circle of readers. We are deeply beholden to Professor Sudhanshu Kumar Sen Gupta, M.A., Ph.D. Leeds, and Professor S. Ramaswamy, M.A., for carefully editing the manuscripts of the book. Publisher, November 1955